Donc, bonjour. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi de vous présenter professeur Jérôme Claveri euh, du département de chimie de l'Université Sherbrooke. Euh, Jérôme a obtenu son doctorat de chimie organique. Je crois que c'était en chimie des polymères, mais, mais, mais j'ai appris euh, une nouvelle. Donc, c'est vraiment un doctorat de chimie organique de la California Institute of Technology. Euh, il a occupé un poste à l'UCAM. Euh, c'est là que je l'ai rencontré pour la première fois, euh, avant de se transférer à l'Université Sherbrooke en 2016, où il est actuellement directeur euh, du département. Ses intérêts de recherche couvrent la chimie des polymères, la chimie des colloïdes et des nanoparticules, ainsi que les matériaux organiques. Jérôme détient la chaire du Canada niveau 1 en chimie des matériaux organiques et hybrides avancés. L'objectif de sa chaire est de répondre aux défis scientifiques, technologiques et économiques liés à la conception, à la production et à l'utilisation de matériaux de façon durable. Les travaux de recherche du Labo de Jérôme ont dernièrement figuré ou, ont, 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 ou du moins attiré l'attention euh, de, de Québec Science euh, à deux reprises. Donc, à 2016, euh, la conception d'un nouveau type de matière plastique thermodurcissable époxy sans bisphénol. Euh, donc, euh, cette conception a figuré euh, parmi les dix découvertes de l'année. Et euh, en 2021, euh, ses travaux sur le développement d'électrolytes à base de polymères solides pour les batteries lithium-métal euh, sont parmi euh, les dix finalistes. Donc, euh, on attend euh, les, la, les résultats euh, du vote qui, j'imagine, va se faire euh, euh, dans les euh, prochains jours, sinon semaines. Donc, euh, on, on se croise les doigts, euh, Jérôme, pour toi. Un donc, grand Jérôme, merci, là. <rire> donc, Jérôme, nous sommes vraiment contents de t'accueillir parmi nous, même si ce n'est euh, qu'en virtuel, euh, pour donner euh, ton séminaire « Du soleil en bouteille, matériaux plasmoniques photocatalytiques », donc en anglais « The sun in a bottle, photocatalytic plasmonic materials ». Donc, euh, j'imagine que je tire le, le bouchon, je laisse sortir le soleil. Je te laisse la parole. So I, I speak in English, right? Or, uh... Yes, yes, fine. <laughs> All right. So uh, sorry for my French accent. I'm born with it. So uh, there's nothing I can do. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, many thanks, Antonella, uh, for this uh, uh, fantastic invitation. I'm very happy to be among you this morning. Um, as you mentioned, Antonella, uh, I'm a polymer chemist. Uh, there was on my PhD, there was, during my PhD, there was no polymer chemistry option. So they said, okay, polymer is organic. So we give you organic chemistry, uh, but I'm not an organic chemist. So uh, the Red Star people are um, um, people working on polymers and lithium batteries. And then we have the green dot, green dotted people are biosourced polymers, uh, for example, to make uh, uh, bisphenol A3 epoxies. Uh, we have a small subgroup working on self-assembled polymers, inorganic nanocomposites, polymer carbon. And uh, today I will uh, speak of the most inorganic project or the most materials oriented project. Uh, where, which is about uh, a heterogeneous photocatalysis. And this uh, domain I actually discovered by accident uh, during my uh, sabbatical in China in 2015. And uh, it, it, uh, it, we discovered that actually as a polymer chemist, we could have a tiny contribution in this domain. So this is what I'm going to present to you. I have erased all the polymer details, so you won't see much polymers over there. But to be frank, uh, most of what we have done, at some point, you needed to work with polymers. And we see you have the uh, Purple Heart people who are uh, our visitors. We are very happy to have visitors coming to our group. And uh, uh, I also would like to extend this invitation to all of you. When you come to Sherbrooke, please come and visit us. We'll be very happy to welcome you. So. Uh, the uh, overarching uh, mechanism of uh, heterogeneous photocatalysis um, is always starting with a semiconductor nanoparticle, typically 
methyloxide nanoparticle. And uh, the first step will uh, consist in the absorption of a photon to generate an exciton. And then uh, the second step will be uh, the separation of the exciton and the diffusion of the charge carrier, so the electron and the hole, all the way to the surface. Uh, and of course, you need to be able to do that without recombination. And then the third step will consist in redox reactions, which occurs at the surface of the semiconductor. And the principal redox reactions we are interested in will be the reduction of water and the oxidation of water. So reduction of water will generate hydrogen, oxidation will generate oxy uh, oxygen. So heterogeneous photocatalysis is, of course, of uh, great interest to um, uh, generate uh, to uh, generate water splitting. Let me see if I can get. Do you see my mouse? Yes. All right. Okay. So I will not work with a uh, laser pointer, but with a mouse uh, uh, to perform water splitting. Um, more recently, people have also looked at uh, CO2 photocatalytic reduction. So that's really truly artificial photosynthesis, where you will take uh, CO2 and water and hopefully generate some methanol, some methane, uh, also some formic acid, some carbon monoxide. But there is also a very large scale application of uh, heterogeneous photocatalysis, which is for the photodegradation of organic pollutants. So if you take the same uh, uh, semiconductor photocatalyst, and if in water now you have like some kind of organic molecule, uh, which can be a pollutant, this organic molecule will be oxidized all the way to carbon dioxide. So basically you will clean up your water. So um, this is a very uh, well-known domain. There are many, many people working on it, but there are also many hurdles. And if I look at the hurdles, for example, in the case of titanium dioxide, which is the archetypal photocatalyst, um, there is three main hurdles. Two of them are shown here. The first one is charge recombination. So in fact, the uh, proportion of uh, electron holes that reach a surface without recombination is usually extremely small, okay? So you lose most of your photons into charge recombinations and very few photons will be able to do um, uh, redox reactions. So that will translate into the IPC. So the IPC is a proportion of photons that basically are able to reach the surface and do redox reactions. So uh, IPCs often are below 10%. And in the visible rate, we typically have IPCs when you use visible light below, very much below 1%. The second problem for uh, titanium dioxide, but for most photocatalysts, is that they only absorb in the UV range. And so compared to the uh, sunlight, right, the UV will uh, only represent 2% of the spectrum. So most of the sunlight energy will be lost. So of course, we will try to work with uh, uh, photocatalysts that have uh, lower band gaps, but as shown a little bit uh, below, uh, this also will generate some problems. Um, this, um, so there is one very little dirty secret uh, of the photocatalytic community. So typically people will report the photocatalytic activity, for example, by the hydrogen production rate. So a good photocatalyst will have a hydrogen uh, production rate around 200 micromole of hydrogen generated per hour per gram of catalyst. So it might look like it's a lot of hydrogen, but in terms of energy, it's only 10 milliwatts per gram of catalyst. So that's actually a very small amount of energy which has been uh, generated. Um, another dirty little secret is that actually very few photocatalysts do water, true water splitting. So when uh, you do true water splitting, your electron will uh, 
basically serve to reduce uh, water to hydrogen and your hole will serve to oxidize water to oxygen. And so for each electron and hole, you will basically go upward in energy by 1.2 electron volt. But the best, the very best photocatalysts that are able to do that currently have a production rate of 10 micromoles per hour and per gram. So in order to fool the uh, journal editors, people will use tricks. For example, they will uh, add a whole scavenger, such as methanol. And in this case, you will see your hydrogen uh, production rate, which will, boost, will be boosted by several orders of magnitude, one or two. Or so. And, uh, but in this case, when you look at the um, mass balance, what you do is that for each hydrogen you create, you actually generate at least one carbon dioxide molecule. So you do methanol reforming. So it's very interesting to produce hydrogen, but the hydrogen you produce is no more green, right? You, you actually generate carbon dioxide to generate your hydrogen. And if you are really, um, uh, if you really want to boost your hydrogen production rate, right, you will add like even less, um, more, I mean, uh, less environmentally friendly uh, whole scavengers uh, such, such as thiosulfate. So then in this case, you will get very high production rates. So at the end, what does it tell us? It tells us that most often, the rate limiting step is a whole extraction. So we need to boost this whole extraction uh, rate in order to get high hydrogen uh, production rates. So um, most of the results I'm going to present to you today are just in true water splitting. We also have some in a uh, methanol reforming steps. We don't, we don't like to use this one because uh, uh, we, basically it uh, makes also some layers of complexity in terms of mechanism. So when we, um, Study uh, this uh, photocatalyst. We have two types of configuration we can use. Uh, the first one is a PEC, photoelectrochemical cell configuration, which was uh, developed initially by uh, Honda and Fujishima in the 70s. And in the PEC, in the PEC setup, it's a very classical setup. Basically, what you do is that you uh, use like an electrochemical cell where you have a photo anode. So your photocatalyst is on a transparent anode. And on this transparent anode, when you have a whole production, the hole will oxidize the water, but the electron would be injected in the conduction band of uh, your semiconductor would be transferred to another uh, uh, electrode, a cathode, where you will have the um, uh, water reduction. So the PEC setup has many advantages. First, because you have a bias between these two electrodes, you will have a very good charge separation, which is one of the major issues in photocatalysis. So the bias will, of course, separate the hole and the electrons. So usually you get a fantastic charge separation. Uh, you can also basically concentrate on one of the half reactions. So typically uh, with an N-type semiconductor, uh, you will uh, only work on the uh, water oxidation and the uh, uh, water reduction will be done on, for example, platinum on the counter electrode. And the third uh, thing, which uh, is also, also of great significance when you do that on a large scale, is that now you can separate your hydrogen and oxygen because you can work with half cells, basically with a membrane in the middle. So your hydrogen and oxygen are completely separated. Whereas when you do that in an other setup, you have a mixture two to one of hydrogen and oxygen, which is not a fantastic mixture to handle because uh, it's explosive. So this advantage <coughs> of this setup is that you are going to work with a very low uh, active surface. Basically, you are limited by the surface of your electrodes. Uh, so 
that does that make much uh, evolved uh, hydrogen or oxygen per gram of catalysts? Uh, sorry, per surface of catalyst, not per gram. You also have a bias between these two electrodes. And so this bias is a thermodynamic penalty. So um, most of the literature um, photocatalytic activities when you work in pieces are measured with a 1.23 electron volt bias, which means that the hydrogen you generate is basically with zero uh, thermodynamic gain because you generate a bias of 1.33 uh, electron volt to generate a molecule which has a 1.23 um, energy. And you have a very low ISTC. And the ISTC are very often not reported. But the ISTC is a solar to chemical conversion. Typically, when we measure them, ISTCs are, are below 1%, which means that um, for one electron, uh, for 100 electrons which arrive here, 99 of them were created by the electrical bias, and only one of them was created by the photo. Uh, generated electron. So most of the uh, chemicals you form are just basically electrochemical uh, hydrogen. So basically you have elect electrolyzed water. Now, if you work with free flowing nanoparticles, so that's another way of working in, electro in uh, photocatalysis. So basically in this case, you just put the uh, nanoparticles in water or in so liquid you want to uh, electrolyze, and you, uh, ir you irradiate with the sun. So in this case, of course, you will uh, benefit from very high surface area. You don't need uh, any electrodes, right? And the reduction and the oxidation occurs both at the surface of the nanoparticle. So that's very advantageous, but uh, the design of the catalyst is very complicated because you need to catalyze on the same surface, both the reduction and the oxidation. And currently there is not a single uh, catalyst which can do both. So you need basically to generate like more complex architectures. And also you do not have any electrochemical bias between the hole and the electrons, so you're you are going to have a uh, have a very high recombination rate. So, despite um, so sorry, so due to that, you will often need to add co-catalyst to your uh, semiconductor na nanoparticle. So the co-catalyst would be in charge of, perf of catalyzing either the reduction or the oxidation uh, reaction, or both. So typical co-catalyst will be uh, metals, such as gold and platinum are very much used, or quantum dots. Nowadays, people also are, are interested in uh, using quantum dots. So despite 20, uh, 40 years of research, titanium dioxide is still one of the best uh, semiconductors in the domain. And uh, why is that? Is that uh, first there are some very simple um, thermodynamic arguments that we can advance. Is that, of course, you need uh, the uh, edge of the uh, uh, valence band of the conduction band to be respectively below and above the reduction potential of, of water and of uh, and the oxidation potential of water. So you see that some photocat some uh, semiconductors such as uh, uh, iron oxide or molybdenum disulfide, um, they do not uh, out tungsten oxide they are not able to reduce uh, water. Or, so these, photo, these semiconductors are very, interest, very interesting in terms of um, uh, other properties, typically, for example, for charge separation. But the, I mean, thermodynamic, thermodynamically, they are unable uh, to perform water splitting. So um, uh, for uh, for water reduction, you see that you only have uh, 
these ones, and for water oxidation, you can have silica, uh, silicium carbide with uh, gallium phosphide. It's very interesting, but of course, there are issues also of, uh, uh, of uh, water corrosion with this metal, uh, with this. Uh, um, uh, semiconductors, but they won't be able to uh, um, also to oxidize water. So you see one of the right one is titanium dioxide. And also titanium dioxide is interesting because it has a fairly low band gap in, you see in the, in the series ex except cadmium sulfide. It is one of the uh, lower band gaps is 3 Vs, which is still in the UV, but uh, uh, but it's also well positioned because the over potential is on the anodic side. So basically, your hole with a, will have a large extra energy to perform the water oxidation. So <clears throat> people have been interested in a, a titanium dioxide for many, many years. But actually, there are not that many uh, fundamental studies on uh, the various titanium dioxide uh, particles. And one of my students, Pekui Wang, uh, said, well, you know, using various polymers, we, will, we should be able to favor different, uh, the growth of different particles facets. And in the literature, everybody, everybody says, you know, the 001 facet of anatase titanium dioxide should be uh, the most active photocatalyst. And the low energy 101 should be uh, not very active. So Pequi very meticulously generated uh, various uh, particles, some of them being truncated by pyramids, uh, which have uh, basically as much 101 surface and 001. And some of them are being nanosheets. Uh, which are very high in 001, and only the edge is 101. And so doing that, so we were able to generate band diagram for 100% bipyramid, 100% nanosheets. And you see that surprisingly, when, uh, the uh, nanosheets, the edge of the conduction band becomes more and more um, positive in potential. And at such point, where it's basically too positive to allow for water reduction. So these are examples of particles we would generate. So um, this represents actually several years of work to, to go to this level of uh, regularity in the particles. So here, these are the particles directly from uh, the sol gel uh, um, experiment. So they are very small, you see like 5 to 20 nanometers. Um, they are crystalline. I mean, you see quite well the crystalline plane, but actually not that crystalline. So there is still a, lots of defects in the particles. And we don't like to work with defects because, of course, these defects can act as catalyst for electron hole recombinations. So you can uh, sonicate them with uh, increase the defects, but also will prevent them from aggregating. We can anneal them, but we have to be very careful during the annihilation, during the annealing story, sorry. But on, uh, eventually, we're able to make these uh, highly regular nanoparticles truncated by pyramids. We can do the same thing with the nanosheets. So the nanosheets are uh, actually uh, quite spectacular. So uh, they look from top as squares with a 001 surface exposed. And on the uh, side, you see that we have uh, typically like two to three nanometer thickness. So they're extremely thin. So that's three nanometer correspond to five um, titanium dioxide uh, cell units in anatase. And these nanosheets, which is what is funny is that if you let them for a long time, uh, they will uh, self-assemble like a jigsaw puzzle. So you see this, they start to pack on top of each other. And eventually, they will mature to become like larger sheets, which eventually will become microcubes. 
So all the trick is to stabilize uh, these nanoshades before they start to stack and become microtubes. Um, so when you look at the activity for water splitting of these different particles, what is uh, kind of amusing is that here we compare uh, the nanocubes to the nanosheets to uh, uh, the truncated bipyramids. We see that the uh, uh, truncated bipyramids are actually much more active for water splitting, approximately six times uh, more. And so uh, this is quite surprising because the only difference here is the surface of 101 uh, facet, which is exposed. So contrary to um, um, popular belief, the 101 facet, which is the low energy facet in titanium dioxide and at test, is more active to do water splitting. So um, we can uh, refine a little bit the design of this catalyst. And for example, the trick which has been uh, very much declined in literature, <coughs> um, we can make like uh, PN junctions within the photocatalyst. So here we have a nickel oxide, it looks like a cable, so it's a uh, it's a nano rod of nickel oxide, which is decorated by uh, N-type titanium dioxide. So they look like a flower. So here you have the nickel oxide and you see the, basically, basically the spikes of titanium dioxide. But in order to uh, get a better uh, contact between the P and N, uh, we put a little bit of graphene. And so graphene is extremely important to allow the, uh, uh, a better separation between the electrons and the holes. And in this case, if you, if you look at the activities in terms of hydrogen evolution, they start to be actually fairly significant. We, we get 250 micromoles of hydrogen per hour per gram. And you see, we can do this experiment for many, many hours. So basically, uh, and we don't get any loss of activity. So we are able to generate water by uh, shining solar light in, uh, with this photocatalyst. So uh, let me segue a little bit to uh, the main topic of uh, this um, communication, which is plasmonic photocatalysis. So plasmonic photocatalysis has been invented to address particularly the issue of the fact that most semiconductors that are active in the photocatalysis are, um, um, have a very high band gap, so they only absorb UV. So the idea was to decorate the semiconductor by a plasmonic nanoparticle such as gold. Gold has been very much used in this domain. Um, and the gold will act as, a, as an antenna to capture visible photons, of course, at the plasmonic frequency, and to uh, activate the semiconductor. And for many, many years, people have been uh, wondering what was the mechanism by which uh, this plasmonic photocatalysis worked. And there is a good review article here that is not by us uh, that uh, reviews the three different uh, mechanisms by which uh, this um, plasmonic photocatalyst work. The most classical uh, mechanism is uh, due to the injection of hot electrons in the conduction band of the uh, semiconductor. So here you have uh, the semiconductor bands, and here you have uh, your plasmonic nanoparticle. And of course, due to the contact, you have a short key uh, barrier. But when you shine a plasmonic light, well, light at the plasmonic uh, frequency on the metal, you can generate these uh, very hot electrons that are able to jump above the short key barrier and to be injected in the conduction band. So the signal for this mechanism is that you should see an increase in photocurrent when you shine light at the plasmonic frequency. There's another mechanism which is a <clears throat> little bit less well described. Um, 
but which is due to um, the fact that the plasmonic field will locally distort um, the band structure of the semiconduct, uh, semiconductor. And in this case, so it's, it's a, a, a localized uh, enhancement of the electromagnetic field. And uh, in this case, you will change um, the um, semiconductor ability to generate electron and holes, and therefore boost the photocatalytic activity. To be very frank, um, this mechanism is really not fully understood. And I think uh, it's basically when you know that you don't have hot electrons, but you still have an effect, you say, oh, it's localized electromagnetic field enhancement. But uh, uh, I mean, usually when you look at the theoretical explanation, it's, it's a bit uh, nebulous. Uh, and then you have uh, something which is much more, uh, better understood, which is a resonant electron transfer. But in the case of titanium dioxide, um, we are not interested in this mechanism because, because it, it only occurs when the plasmodic nanoparticle uh, is, um, has its plasma frequency and the energy of the band gap of uh, the um, semiconductor. So, in the case of titanium dioxide, band gap is around 3.2 electron volts. It's in the UV. So we will need to use uh, plasmonic nanoparticles uh, in the UV. So it's not very uh, interesting for us. So um, we started our trip in the uh, plasmonic photocatalyst by uh, generating very simple structures which contained titanium dioxide, gold, and carbon. And uh, as shown a little bit previously, you know, this uh, is, uh, we, we know that carbon improves the photocatalytic activity, but we, we are not sure exactly why. And so what I must say is that in all these experiments, we always use, always use the exact amount, same amount of titanium dioxide of carbon and gold. But uh, the position of the gold, titanium dioxide, and carbon is not in the, always the same. So we have cases where we basically coat the titanium dioxide by three to five layers of graphene. And that can be done once again because we have a, a, some polymers that can decompose, which we can carbonize into a low quality graphene. So we are able to, uh, to very carefully uh, control the number of layers of graphene that we put on top of titanium dioxide. So titanium dioxide, three to five layers of, of graphene, and on top the gold nanoparticles. We have the uh, opposite architecture where the gold is on top of titanium dioxide, and both of them are coated by graphene. And then we have the sandwich architecture where the gold is sandwiched uh, in carbon on top of titanium dioxide. And so when uh, we look, for example, uh, like photo degradation experiments, we always observe that the sandwich structure is the one which do the photo degradation the fastest. When we look at photocurrents, so these are typical um, uh, photocurrent experiments that are done uh, in a PEC, in a photoelectric photoelectrochemical cell, we see that uh, the sandwich structure will generate the highest photocurrent, so more electrons. Uh, and when we sh stop shining light, so it's, here's it's, uh, cycles where we stop light, we put the light on, we stop light. You see that as soon as we stop light, we have no, no current. We put back light, we get photocurrents. And so, um, you see that here the photocurrent for the sandwich is better than the one where the gold is direct, uh, uh, directly on top of uh, titanium dioxide, which is itself better than the one where you have titanium dioxide, carbon, and gold on top. We can also look at IPCs. And in this case, we see that once again, the IPC, which is the quantum yield, uh, 
in the visible uh, range is higher for uh, the sandwich structure. So we have a 2% IPC, which means that 2% of our visible uh, photons are separated into electron holes, which is, I mean, uh, actually a fairly high number in this domain. And the fact that this uh, maximum corresponds to uh, the wavelengths of uh, the plasma of these gold nanoparticles is a signature of plasmonic photocatalysis. So we were very happy because, okay, when we put a small layer of uh, carbon all around the particle and titanium dioxide, we get a better plasmonic effect, okay? Uh, the problem is that when we look at the hydrogen evolution, well, things get very different. You see that uh, everything which contains uh, carbon on top of the gold is not good. So the sandwich um, architecture has a very low hydrogen evolution rate. We generate very little hydrogen. And those which are good are those where the gold nanoparticle is directly exposed to the water surface. And of course, retrospectively it makes totally sense because the goal is necessary to catalyze the uh, water reduction. So when we cover the gold by carbon, then the surface of gold is not uh, accessible to water. And so therefore we are not able to generate hydrogen. So this is where we started to say, okay, you know, that's little bit, what we thought was very simple, is little bit more complicated uh, that we thought. But at the end, you know, we no one will be interested in generating green hydrogen with a catalyst that contains gold. It's just going to be too expensive. So uh, can we repress gold by non-noble metals? And so we started this work uh, where we thought maybe we could use titanium nitride instead of gold. And so uh, there have been several reports, most of them uh, coming from the group, uh, group of Boltaseva in uh, Purdue in the US, where they demonstrated that titanium nitride is a metal which has a plasmonic um, signature in the, uh, depending on the size, it's a very broad uh, plasmonic uh, plasma absorption, typically in the 400 to 800 nanometers uh, range. And it extends all the way to uh, the infrared to the up to 12, uh, 1200 nanometers. So it's not like gold where the plasma is very well, it's sharp and it's directly related to the size of the particle. It's a very broad plasma. But in intensity, it's comparable in strength to the one of gold. <clears throat> so we thought, okay, well, instead of doing titanium dioxide uh, gold photocatalyst, let's do titanium dioxide, titanium nitride. And so uh, before we did this work, there was actually one uh, reported paper um, where they actually did some uh, titanium dioxide nanowires and they put on top some titanium nitride mm, things. I'm not sure exactly how to call them. Um, and they measured the, acti uh, the photocatalytic activity in a PEC uh, setup. And the results were extremely interesting uh, because uh, what they see is that uh, it's an increase in photocurrents due to the presence of titanium nitride. So uh, once again, that signature of uh, plasmonic, plasmonic photocatalysis, you decorate your uh, semiconductor by a plasmonic nanoparticle, you have an increase in photocurrent. And also they looked at the position of the bands of titanium nitride and titanium dioxide. And what they say is that instead of being um, hot electron injection from the plasma of titanium nitride to the conduction band of titanium dioxide, they propose it was just a simple uh, ohmic interface. Basically, uh, the titanium nitride is so high on energy that you can get 
direct injection of electrons within the conduction band. And that we, we were a little bit less satisfied by this explanation because it didn't seem to fit with our results. So what we did is that uh, we generated some uh, titanium dioxide. This is anatase. We used, in this case, nanobelts. So these nanobelts are very, very long particles, typically 5, 10 microns long, 200 nanometer wide, but 20 nanometers uh, thick. So they look like these uh, nanoplatelets. And on top of them, we put some uh, titanium nitride nanoplates. They are sold by the manufacturers as nanocubes, but in fact, they are really nanoplates. So 25 nanometer by 25 nanometer by five nanometers. So basically what, when we do that, uh, there's a little bit of trick here because we need to disperse well titanium nitride. It's very difficult to disperse, but we can absorb, you see these nanoplates on top of the uh, nanobelts. So here you see the nanobelt in dark, uh, and on top, less dark, you see the titanium nitrides. And when we look at the photocurrents, so for the nanobelt, we have a fairly low photocurrent. Uh, we have an IPC at 370 nanometers, uh, under 370 nanometer irradiation of 6%. So that's very typical. But when we uh, put the titanium nitride, the photocurrent is now much greater. The IPC reaches 40%. So it's a very high value. Um, but of course, that's a little bit surprising because it's now we are at a 300, a 370 nanometer, which is absolutely not the plasma frequency of titanium nitride. The plasma frequency of titanium nitride is around 700 to 1000 nanometers, it's a broad plasma. So when we look in the visible range, here it's an experiment which has been done at 600 nanometer, the photocurrents are now ridiculously small. So if you look with a huge magnifier, you can find a small photocurrent, but you see the, here we are speaking of nano amperes per square centimeter, it's really extremely small. And so basically we don't see any significant improvement of photocurrents in the visible range. So that was a little bit disappointing. Uh, we looked also, we did uh, some uh, more chunky analysis, which indicated that uh, the increase in photocurrent was not consistent with the ohmic junction. So something else was happening. We look at the photo degradation of uh, organic pollutants. So in this case, when uh, we take uh, pure uh, titanium dioxide nanobelts, uh, we are able to decompose the, uh, the pollutants at 300 nanometers, but as soon as we take visible light, uh, we have no more de uh, decomposition. It's normal because uh, the light has not a high enough energy to generate an electron hole pair. But when we put the titanium nitride on top of it, then, uh, with the photocatalyst was able to degrade the uh, uh, several pollutants. Here it's done with methylene blue. We were also able to do it with methyl orange. So one is a cationic dye, the other one is anionic. So it seems to be a general effect. So that's good news. Um, but when we look at hydrogen production, basically we had zero hydrogen uh, production when we put the titanium nitride on top of that. So none of that made any sense. For sure, we could say that titanium nitride activates the titanium dioxide catalyst, but it's not a plasmonic effect. So uh, my student, Diane, uh, very smartly, did a, a control experiment where she basically looked at the photocurrent of pure titanium nitride. Titanium nitride is a metal. So you should not be able to have any photocurrent with uh, a metal, right? So you cannot generate an electron hole pair in a metal. But to her surprise, she actually measured fairly large photocurrents with pure titanium nitride. So uh, how does it, what happens? So we did a series of uh, spectroscopic analysis. I don't show them, but they always come in support of all this analysis. 
And basically, of course, we uh, showed that the titanium nitride is highly unstable uh, in water. And what we do is basically like a coarse nanoparticle where the uh, surface is oxidized titanium uh, uh, nitride, basically it's titanium dioxide, and the core will be titanium nitride. And so this, of course, basically we have, what we have done is like endo titanium dioxide. And now that explains why uh, we get this kind of uh, photocatalytic activity. So titanium nitride in water does not survive. And, um, but we have made a very interesting uh, photocatalyst, which is the end of titanium dioxide. It's, it's well known, but not under this form. This one is particularly good. And when we add a, a little bit of platinum, so the uh, co-catalyst, then we are able to generate massive amounts of uh, hydrogen. And because the core of the titanium nitride in this particle is now shielded from water. So if you look at the surface of the particle, it's 100% titanium dioxide. And the further away you go from the surface, when you go in the core, you go to 100% titanium nitride. So in this case, you can have a plasmonic signature in the uh, visible range. So you see a little bit of uh, increase in IPC in the visible range. So to conclude, I mean, uh, our initial uh, idea to replace gold by titanium nitride was interesting, but it does not really succeed because titanium nitride is just not stable enough to survive in the very photocorroding environments that we have in uh, photocatalysis. So we looked at uh, something else, which is the use of copper instead of gold. And uh, you say, well, you're, you're crazy, copper is so oxidatively uh, unstable and we agreed but we said maybe we can uh, use our polymers to cover the copper by a shell of carbon a very thin shell of carbon so copper has a plasmon which is basically quite similar to the one of gold but copper unless unlike gold uh, gets very easily oxidized so this is the work of uh, pepe uh, and it's a work which is done in a, a collaboration with Professor Rudiger at, I, at INRS. So the design of our catalyst was once again a nano belt of titanium dioxide with on top some copper nanoparticles that are surrounded by a shell of carbon. So this is the image we have. So these are the titanium nano belts. And on top, we, and Pepe, not we, managed to put these copper nanoparticles. But when you generate the carbon shell, you actually oxidize most of your copper. So I was quite disappointed because um, before carbonization, the copper particles were very nice. But after carbonization, they were truly ugly. And when we look carefully, we have a mixture of copper oxide. This is cupric oxide. We also have some copperous oxide, and we have some copper. So that's an ugly mixture of uh, copper. So these are the ugly nanoparticles. But these nanoparticles are surrounded by a thin layer of carbon. That's going to make a huge difference. So you see here this uh, titanium uh, nanobelts with the ugly nanoparticles on top of it. We are also able to generate some uh, titanium dioxide with nice, well-defined copper zero nanoparticles. And in this case, what we did is that we just prepared some copper nanoparticles uh, decorated by an uh, organic ligand, hexadecylamine, which is, of course, very uh, organic, very hydrophobic, so prevents the copper from being oxidized. And so when we looked at the uh, photocatalytic activity, we discovered that the uh, nice nanoparticles actually didn't perform very well. And the ugly nanoparticles gave a very high photocatalytic activity. And um, so we, I mean, Pepe uh, did a lot of, uh, different variations to try to understand what was happening and my screen okay I think i'm going to skip that for the sake of time 
And so uh, basically what happens, and it took a while to really understand what, what happens. So when you start with the nice copper zero nanoparticles, you see those are well dispersed on the surface of your titanium dioxide versus the ugly copper, copper oxide nanoparticles uh, on top of uh, titanium dioxide, but surrounded by carbon. After photocatalysis, these uh, ugly ones become nice. So after photocatalysis, you get very nice, it's very cold, copper zero nanoparticles surrounded uh, by a carbon layer. Whereas the nice one, the initially nice one, you see they become all agglomerated. And uh, when you look at them by uh, uh, XPS or by um, high resolution TEM, what you discover is, of course, no more copper, but a mixture of copper, copper oxide, and so on. So what happens, and what we were able to show, is that during the photocatalysis, you get Oswald ripening occurring in the copper. So the copper gets oxidized, you get copper 2 plus, and under the action of light, you get photoreduction. So basically, you lose completely the plasmonic activity of your initial copper nanoparticles. But if you do the same reaction with particles that are in a shell of carbon, of course, the shell of carbon will prevent the Oswald ripening. And under the action of uh, the light, you get photoreduction. So you get actually eventually very nice uh, copper zero nanoparticles, which are able to do a uh, plasmonic photocatalysis um, without any Oswald ripening. So um, basically, uh, we, it's, it's a group we say that uh, it's a telltale of uh, Basically, it's the ugly ones is the winner at the end, so not the nice one. So the nice copper nanoparticles, uh, also they initially they have a plasmonic uh, effect, they get very easily destroyed, so they're not oxidatively stable. Whereas the ugly ones, surrounded by carbon, they actually do the trick, and you get, in this case, a very nice copper plasmonic effect and a high photocatalytic activity. So these are basically... Uh, what I wanted to tell you, I think I'm going to pass that for the sake of time. Um, I also wanted to show you uh, two little uh, uh, snippets of uh, what we have done in the past. I think uh, let's remember that eventually we believe photocatalysis could be uh, interesting to generate hydrogen, but we are very far from that. However, photocatalysis can be used on the industrial scale to depollute uh, water. And so this is an image of a textile factory in a Jiaxing, uh, not very far from uh, uh, Shanghai. And this is where most of the textile industry die, textile dyeing industry in uh, China is located. And so you see, that day, this plant used an orange colorant. And uh, after, although they treat the water at the exit of the plant, you still get 80 ppm of dye in the water. And so uh, with uh, Mr. Liu, with uh, Bai Shan Liu, when I was in sabbatical, and we worked on the implementation of photocatalytic plant to treat water, and it's amazingly efficient. So uh, this is a pilot plant uh, for photocatalysis. Uh, that's pilot plant Chinese scale, of course. And uh, you see after uh, like this 20 minutes irradiation. So the water comes and stay for 20 minutes in the reactor and comes out. You get this very transparent water, which contains now less than 10 ppm of, uh, of dye. So, and this plant, this pilot plant is able to treat 3,000 cubic meters per hour. Uh, last time I talked to Bai Shan, he told me that now they were doing like industrial scale, which are 10 times larger. So that's 30,000 square meter per hour. So you are basically able to treat an Olympic uh, swimming pool in one day. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to pass that. 
Uh, of course, before I answer to any question, I would be, I want to thank my students. Uh, the work I showed you today is the work of mostly three very gifted students, Pei Kui Wang, Pei Pei Liu, Diane Rawash. Uh, there was also work from a postdoc with no professor in China, Jian Zhang. Uh, I want to thank my collaborators. I want to thank the funding agencies, and I'm sorry for being so long. So maybe you have time for a few questions. Oui, merci beaucoup, Jérôme. Thank you, Jérôme, for this very nice uh, presentation of uh, where is the, the technology for this kind of conversion. Um, and I have a, like a, you, you did mention that you were able to put like graphene coated around like a nanoparticle, but did you do that also for the titanium nitride ones? No. And, and uh, would that be useful or? It, it will be very useful. Um, I mean, titanium nitride is really a complicated beast. I thought it was a simple material and we initially bought some and it's a very low quality. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately for us, the, uh, it's a steep uh, curve to take turning the titanium nitride because it's so uh, oxidatively unstable. I was so surprised. It's a refractory material, and yet it oxidized yeah. mm -hmm. very fast. And actually, uh, you know, most of the XPS of titanium nitride surfaces are nearly 100% titanium oxide, dioxide so <laughs> XPS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yes, it would be very useful, uh, but we need to, um, tame this beast a little bit better currently. So uh, Pepe very courageously started to, to make some uh, homemade titanium nitride. Mm -hmm. So we do nitrogenation at 900 degrees with uh, ammonia. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we have fingers crossed. But uh, you know, to be frank, there's only one single group which has truly reported the titanium nitride plasmonic effect. Um, okay. <laughs> many of us are trying. Okay. Thank you. François. Oui, uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, vraiment très intéressante présentation. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, uh, titanium nitride, the main use I know of that is to coat uh, tools and uh, blades and uh, etc. So I'm surprised that uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't resist water, basically. So is is this uh, actually a passivation layer that forms? It's, it's a passivation layer, but for us, 10 nanometers, it's, yeah, it's too thick. that's enough. Right? Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, when you look at a thick coating, um, there's one paper where they looked at that. It's a couple of uh, maybe 10, 20 nanometers. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, at the beginning of your presentation, you show how uh, sulfit or uh, SO3 or uh, molecules like yeah. that would catalyze and help. Is is there any way to reoxidize uh, the, the sulfite and sure. use it like a, as a catalyst but, somehow or uh, instead of? Uh, but it will cost you energy, so you know. Yeah. So everybody use it's it's really dirty because uh, the field is, I think, uh, not uh, very honest because people report these gigantic uh, hydrogen production rates, but then you need to find in, a, in very small characters in the back of the supporting information. Oh, we did our experiment with uh, that uh, whole uh, scavenger. So it could be a sulfide, it can be, there. people have like crazy whole scavengers that boost the activity by a, a factors of 10 or 100. At the end, okay, you have done a, a you know, high impact factor paper, but you know, it's not very interesting. Mm -hmm. Merci. Um, I have a question. Jerome, at the beginning, the structures you showed, the cube, the sheet, and then something that that looks like it was it, it, it was faceted. So you you had said, I think, if I understood correctly, that you were surprised that it was the one that had um, 
that, that, that was more yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, trying Pyramid. shaped. Yeah, exactly. That, so, that was more active. Is that because you know you've got you've got defects, you've got uh, you 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 have edges, uh, uh, corners uh, yeah. uh, in that type of structure uh, more than it, let's say in the cube. You know, you put the, uh, your finger on something which is so crucial. <laughs> okay, all these studies. So people have, uh, I think, do you see the screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, so, uh, so you have several effects. You have the intrinsic activity of the facet, okay? And in literature, everybody said 001 is a high energy facet in titanium dioxide. Its surface energy is around 0 0.9 um, joule per square meter, I think. And uh, 101 is half of that. So normally you would expect high energy facet to be more active. So, uh, but in fact, when people would uh, generate these uh, particles, they will do them with different amounts of defects, which of course these are not easy to characterize. And it's not a, uh, so, so the work of PQ is solid because we compare particles which have basically no defects. They are highly crystalline. Uh, there are very few defects. So, uh, but you are absolutely right. Uh, defects will make a complete difference in terms of activity. Some defects, for example, will act as scavengers. So they will act as catalysts for combinations. Okay. So if you have too many defects, then you say, oh, there is no, no good activity, but just because the hole on the electrons they don't reach the surface, they, they, they recombine before that. Okay. And how did you make these? I, I mean, you, you said it was by salt gel. Does, it, did it, does the process involve uh, uh, surfactants or no? You, you know, if I was honest, I would say, I don't know if we should ask Pequi. <laughs> okay. okay, it's fair, <laughs> it's fair. But no, I mean, well, there's a series of, there's some hydrothermal, there's some gel, salt gel, you, you need to prevent the high energy facets from growing. Uh, from, uh, you know, basically, you know, normally uh, the high energy facets wants to be transformed in low energy facets. So, uh, so PQI has been very, very good at um, uh, tweaking that. Um, if you want a real recipe, we more than happy to give you that, but you know, it's, it's a fairly lengthy process. You have to be very careful. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christian. Merci, Jérôme. C'est uh, toujours surréal de voir Jérôme présenter parce qu'il parle d'un sujet complètement différent d'une fois à l'autre, puis on a l'impression qu'il fait ça à longueur de journée uniquement. Donc, c'est uh, une nouvelle version pour moi aujourd'hui. Um, I was wondering the... Uh, for the uh, copper reduction or copper oxides reduction at the end, what happens to the oxygen? And does it play a role? Because I, I, I remember for uh, electrodes uh, for lithium ion batteries that the first cycle creates some oxygen that apparently plays some role into the activity later on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, uh, the carbon layer, uh, the three five graphene um, number is, it's a magical uh, number. It's because our graphene is not perfect. Uh, you know, it's more like uh, RGOs and uh, it's not the graphene of physicists, which is made by CVD, perfect, perfect monolayer. Our graphene is full of holes. So uh, 3.5 is enough to allow for the diffusion of uh, oxygen, maybe a bit of water. <laughs> So uh, when I say, uh, so otherwise you're right. I mean, if you have copper oxide and it's within a complete carbon, a thick carbon shell, nothing happens to it because you know the oxygen cannot go anywhere. Mm -hmm. You have 100% right. So in order to get photo reduction, you need of course to have uh, water in contact uh, or carbon in contact with your, um, with your copper oxide. Uh, maybe, we have not measured it. It will be, I think, uh, not that easy, but maybe what happens is actually you actually oxidize your carbon and you generate CO2. 
Thank you. Je, je regarde. Are there any? Oh, Michel. Ben, tu peux, euh, oh, tu peux y aller avec l'autre avant. Là. Uh, oui, oui, pardon, c'est face. OK, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I am coming from a, uh, the point of a young scientist or a young, uh, let me say, a chemist. So I want to know, let's say, if I want to begin a, 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 a new study into this area and I don't want to go using, let's say, titanium oxide, what, uh, let me say, cr um, criteria should I be following to, let's say, investigate new ones that, that might be very active? Then in case I want to also incorporate polymers into this one, what should I also be looking out for? Thank okay. you. Um, that's a very difficult question. Um, you know, we we started, we were not at all in this domain like six years ago, seven years ago. You know, I started as if I was a master student, <laughs> a bachelor student seven years ago, and it was totally crazy. But uh, little by little, we discovered that actually there are many, many, many papers in this domain which have not been done uh, carefully. It's, it's easy to publish uh, something in this domain, but it's often not meaningful. So as a, as a new researcher, uh, a, a researcher, a senior researcher to be, um, I would advise you to take whatever material you like and start by yourself <laughs> and ask you the right questions. You know, am I sure that I demonstrated what I wanted to demonstrate? Often, you know, uh, I didn't show them, but all these studies are supported with many, many studies of XRD, XPS, mm. uh, electrochemistry, um, let's see, that's um, a TEM, uh, SEAD, uh, you have to, uh, EDX, you, you know, you have to do all of that and not accept anything until you have the complete uh, conversion story, you know. Often when I see the XPS that are reported in the domain, there are, most of them are like, um, how to say, you know, the interpretation takes so much time. So this is really where I would advise this field is an interesting field, but it's not currently done uh, rigorously enough. I mean, so um, several materials are extremely interested, interesting. Um, I think LTOs uh, seems to be uh, quite new, quite interesting. Um, BFOs, the bismuth ferrites, also extremely interesting. So, you know, pick one. Okay, please, thank you. Michel? Okay, maybe another one. Um, I'm interested in, in your purifying of water. You, um, I, I understand that the dye gets break in in the process and does it where is the waste going because you it's you, only co2 and water co2 okay co2 yes of course you uh, you so in, in this case um the full process is that you you oxidize uh the dye all the way to co2 and you reduce oxygen so you need to supply your reactor with oxygen the okay. oxygen becomes a superoxide which attacks the dye and so on, makes the uh, photodegradation. And so the dye itself doesn't produce another waste that, you know. So it could be the case if you have halogens, yeah. uh, if you have halogens on the dye or like heteroatoms. Or, so if you have a nitrogen, you, you I mean, optimally you go to nitro, uh, nitrate. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, in some cases, people have seen nitrites, mm -hmm. which of course are really not too good. But uh, then you need to post-treat your nitrite containing water to nitrates. Okay. Uh, the problem is in certain cases when you use too active a photocatalyst, with, which contains chloride, and when your dye contains a chloride, you might generate some chlorine. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But the main issue, actually, it's a very simple issue. It's the hydrogen. Oh, yeah. You don't want. <laughs> you don't want it. <laughs> you don't want it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jerome. Very nice. Are there any other questions for Jerome? Arthur? I said that was a very enlightening talk. Yes. Sir. Thank you very much. It's very appreciated. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope to meet you uh, in uh, person. And uh, you are very welcome to come and uh, visit my lab. And if you want to measure, if you have like materials, you want to uh, measure the photocatalytic activity, uh, please come. We are, we are well set up for it. And uh, it's, always, it's always a fun experiment to do. Thank you. I think, I, I think from my point of view, what I really appreciated is that you were very frank about some of the tricks that people do to, to publish, but you, you clearly showed us that if you ask the right questions and you're rigorous in your approach, the impact that you can make in the field. So thank you very much, Jerome, for keeping it honest. Okay, <laughs> for once. <laughs> no, you're, you're always like that. And I, I know that being a member of CQMF and RQMP, uh, you know, I'm, I'm between the two, so I'm, go I'm going to root, I think all of us are going to root for both you and Louis. Uh, I, I think that would be the, 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 the most outstanding outcome if, if uh, both uh, of your uh, work uh, uh, is recognized. So oh, keep thank your you fingers crossed. Okay, bye-bye, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.